Hello everyone, my name is Eric Jones, better known as the Turf Teacher. Welcome to the lecture entitled Pesticides and the Environment. This information comes directly from your North Carolina Pesticide Applicator Certification Core Manual. This is Chapter 6. So let's get started with our course objectives. We're going to list four ways pesticides can move in the environment. We're going to describe conditions that cause drift. We're going to understand point source and non-point source contamination. We're going to explain how solubility, persistence, adsorption, and degradation can affect pesticide movement. We're going to prevent pesticides from entering water sources. We don't want them in our drinking water, do we guys? So we got to pay close attention to these details. Identify what sensitive areas are, and then explain how pesticides can harm our endangered species. And probably one of the most important ones on here, guys, is the drift. Drift can happen on any given day that we have high winds. They don't even have to be extremely high winds. Guys, we could have five to 10 mile an hour winds and you could have pesticide drift. Now you could have particle drift and you could have vapor drift and those are two separate things. Particle drift is the actual water molecules or the dust, whatever the particle is that you're spraying, whether it's liquid or dry, being carried off in the wind. Your vapor drift happens when you're applying a chemical and it's hot enough that it volatizes and that it turns into a gas and the gas rises and then the wind moves the pesticide off site. So two very dangerous situations, guys, when it comes to drift. People call all the time, hey, Eric, is it too hot to spray? Well, no, it's not too hot to spray. So it's not gonna volatize, but check your wind speed. Have that happen all the time. Is it too hot? Is it too windy? Guys, it's common sense. But first, you need to read the label, and it's going to explain these things. It's going to tell you the temperature maximum and minimums that you can apply this pesticide, and then you need to check wind speed. And you need to be near zero on a, wind, on a, on a day. Uh, you need to not spray on a windy day is what I'm saying. And you don't need to be out applying pesticides uh, when you're going to have you know, five to 10 mile an hour winds or even higher. You, you, need to, you need to find the steel part of the day, and that's usually gonna be early morning or even late afternoon. You don't wanna spray midday anyway because that's the hottest part of the day. So early morning spray, pesticide applications, even granular need to be made, uh, you know, early morning up to about lunch. And I know a lot of lawn care companies that do stop uh, shortly right at lunch or right after lunch. So our introduction, the environment is everything around us. It may include natural or even man-made elements. Guys, your environment, if you're watching TV, is the living room. If you're outside in your garden, that is your environment. If you step out into your neighborhood, your neighborhood is the environment. The environment is everything that is surrounding you. And so basically everywhere is an environment. Where people are, where animals are, where living plants are, it is the environment is everything and it doesn't have to be living it can be a man-made structure is your environment and when using your pesticides ask yourself where will this pesticide go in the environment after i apply it and what damage might this cause to a non-target site i've got a good good example of a situation here former student of mine uh, grows tobacco they have a strawberry farm excellent student of mine and has a thriving business uh, well their neighboring farm uh, was applying a chemical to their tobacco and they ran over there and said look hey don't do that we've got we're you know we've got our vents open and stuff on our greenhouse tomatoes we can't you know have you applying the pesticides today because look how windy it is I mean it was high winds that day the farmers like I don't care I've got to get it done who cares ain't nothing gonna happen ain't nothing gonna happen well they had their greenhouse tomato house is open and all of that pesticide drift got sucked through and it killed every single one of their tomatoes. Well, that ended up being a negative or a nasty lawsuit, which my student won, but still they tried preventing it. The farmer didn't, didn't take heed to it, sprayed the application anyway, and he had to uh, reimburse them for their losses. Not only the plant loss, but you know, future losses, their profit, their money that they were uh, dependent on living on that part, uh, that time of the year. So guys, all of this is it should be common sense and that's what really i guess bothers me a little bit is that when you see people out there doing stuff that you know they shouldn't be doing and after this course guys this should be a no-brainer i don't spray when it's too hot and i don't spray when it's too windy so uh, you last thing you want to do is have to pay uh, for somebody's 
uh, vegetable crop or, you know, worse, their whole agricultural crop that can be their livelihood. And I've seen it done. Drift. All right, well, so pesticide movement uh, is going to be called, caused by drift. It can be movement in the air. Uh, wind or air currents move the pesticides away from the target site as a vapor or particles. We just talked a little bit about uh, vapor drift and particle drift. And then vent systems or forced air systems can cause drift within structures. Let's say you make a pesticide application and you have to turn the ventilation on, it gets too hot in there or whatever, you still got the pesticide residues and the actual pesticide itself, whether it being wet or like a dusting, on your crop and you have to turn the ventilation system on when it sucks it out, that could go outside or it could move over to another side of the greenhouse um, that, that that pesticide could kill another crop that you're growing. So guys, you have to be careful uh, when you're doing it in, inside of a greenhouse or inside of a structure where you're actually growing the crops. Uh, you can have runoff or leaching. That is movement in the soil and water. Runoff can carry pesticides to drainage systems, streams, ponds, and other surface water. And then leaching can even carry the pesticide through the soil into subsurface water sources, which could be our wells, could be where we're getting our drinking water from. So guys, you have to be careful. You have to pay close attention to weather patterns. Hey, what is, what is, to, what is today's or tonight's weather going to be? Are we going to have a monsoon tonight that if I put this application down, it's not even going to be effective on the plants that I'm applying it to, that it's actually going to wash the whole product away. You have to take these into consideration and kind of study how our weather is going to act or be in the next few days. And some of these uh, chemicals, you may not even want to turn the irrigation system on until it completely dries. So guys, read the label. The label is going to help you figure this stuff out. We can have movement by clothing, equipment, plants, or animals. Uh, and the residues of these pesticides can remain after a spill and be transferred to people, plants, and, uh, or other animals. Well, let's think about it. Guys, you're out making a pesticide application. You get it all over your clothing. You go into your house. You pick up your kid and you hug your spouse. What have you just done? You've contaminated them. Or what if you go right to the laundry room and take it off and put it in the washer and then your wife comes in and throws the baby's clothes in with your pesticide clothes? What have you just done? You've still contaminated your child. Guys, you need a separate place to wash your clothing that you are using for pesticide applications. And we talk more about that in the PPE chapter, but guys, have a separate laundry facility in your shop. If you are a true 100% lawn care company or you're applying pesticides in your business, have a place for you and your employees to wash those clothes. They need to come in and change and have that stuff washed at night, guys. It's too dangerous uh, to have um, those chemicals even come into your home. And better yet, just get a uniform service. That'd be the best way to do it. You can transfer residues inside your home yeah, by bringing in the contaminated clothes. Well, think about what if you make a pesticide application to a lawn and then that dog, the neighbor's dog, runs through it and then takes it into their house or your client's dog runs through it and runs inside the house. You need to warn everybody. You need to let them know that you're making the application. Some states require pre-notification of a pesticide, but you at least need to have a sign in the yard that says treatment made today. And you need to make sure that your clients have their pets locked up and let the pesticide dry before anybody uh, is out there. Uh, movement properties. We have degradation, we have persistence, solubility, adsorption, and volatility. And we're going to talk about each one of those in the next uh, few slides. And degradation, that is pesticides start to break down after they're applied. That's just natural. They may be broken down by water, which is a chemical process, bacteria, by soil microorganisms, by sunlight, which is photodegradation, and then either by plant or animal metabolism. The manure and stuff or the droppings from the plant material is going to help break down or degrade uh, that pesticide. And this, guys, this information uh, starts on page 86 in your textbook. And, um, you know, degradation is just a natural process that is going to happen. We have persistence. In persistence, the pesticide may remain present and active for a long time period of time, which means it can harm living things in the environment over time or end up as an illegal residue in crops. It's very important to prevent the movement of these persistent pesticides. Guys, it could be illegal in some situations. So you need to re read that label 
and it's going to tell you if that residue is illegal to have. Um, one example of a persistent pesticide is a termite application. We saw in previous lectures that when they're uh, spraying uh, for termites underneath a concrete pad, well, that chemical's there. It's there for, for forever, just about. And so that treatment is going to prevent the termites from ever getting into that home. And so just think about some of the other chemicals that we use that are you know, even more dangerous. Hey, you don't want that persistent to be moved from site to site. You don't want to have that residue that uh, could get you into some trouble. Solubility, the pesticide dissolves easily in water. Pesticides that dissolve in water easily are more susceptible to being washed away in surface water. So you need to take that in consideration. Adsorption, the pesticide binds to soil particles which slows the movement um, off-site. So it's gonna slow it down, but oil soluble pesticides are more likely to absorb uh, than the water soluble pesticides. And guys, what we have here is adsorption is actually the sticking to the clay particles, whereas absorption is where they're actually coming into or actually mixing uh, with the soil. That adsorption um, um, can be a bad thing. It's, it, um, well, adsorption will actually slow that process of it being transported from one site to another, which is a, which is a, a, a good thing. Um, volat volatility. The tendency of the pesticide to convert into a gas or vapor and move off site by drift. This is what causes our vapor drift. It gets hot and you make an application. It turns that liquid into a gas. It rises and then the wind takes it off. And right here it says that if the temperature and winds up, there's higher volatility. Humidity also being down equals higher volatility, guys. So, so be careful. Uh, with your temperatures and making sure that you're not spraying when it gets too hot and then when it's not too windy. Um, let's see. Preventing drift. Guys, it is the applicator's responsibility for preventing drift. No exceptions. It relies on you. Everything is your fault when you are the pesticide applicator when something goes bad. Check the label for warnings regarding the volatility, equipment recommendation, and precautions on weather. Guys, again, the label's going to tell you everything. If you don't know what the label is, then go back and look at reading the pesticide label chapter. That is very good information. You have to understand the information that the label gives you. Make sure there is no temperature inversion or wind that will cause drift. And we're gonna talk about temperature inversion here in a minute. But this statement comes directly from your textbook. The North Carolina Pesticide Board regulations related to pesticide drift. No person shall apply pesticide under search conditions that drift from pesticides, particles or vapors results in adverse effect. Pesticide particles means the active ingredient of a pesticide as a liquid, spray droplet, granular, pet, pellet, dust, fumigant, etc. You can't spray it, guys, if it's going to cause drift. It is illegal, and the pesticide board is regulating this. And you don't want to end up on the back of the pamphlet that, uh, or the back of their newsletter that talks about all the violations that's occurred here recently. Table 6.1 in your book talks about ways to reduce pesticide drift from spray droplets. The nozzle adjustments. Read the nozzle or read the pesticide label and the nozzle guide to find the right combination of nozzle and pressure. Use the largest droplets to provide coverage. Use large nozzle openings for larger, heavier drops because the heavier drops are less likely to be carried away. They're heavier, they're gonna fall. Use drift reduction nozzles. Weather conditions, do not spray in windy conditions, duh. Do not spray during temperature inversions. We're gonna talk about that here in a minute. And do not spray when humidity is low and the temperature is high. Spray height, lower the boom or nozzle height to reduce off target drift and then maintain even travel speed. Buffer zone, leave a no spray buffer zone around sensitive areas. Droplet size, use a drift control additive to increase the droplet size. And then increase viscosity or the thickness of the liquid. And then for indoor application, use a low volatile or non-volatile pesticides, use only low pressure treatments, and then turn off fans and air conditioners and close the vents. But, you know, you're not going to be applying a pesticide in your home. If you do, you're gonna, you're gonna hire one of the structural pest control uh, companies to do that for you. 
At least I do. Guys, I'm a pesticide applicator. And when it comes to my home, and I guess I respect the law and the label enough that I'm going to hire it done. I have a company that comes out once every three months and they do all the treatments that needs to be done outside the home and inside the home for, for mice, for cockroaches, for everything. They're doing the termite treatment outside. I just pay them the money. It's so much easier for me than to actually go and purchase this pesticide, get that pesticide license itself because I'm a ground applicator. I'm an ornamental and turfs guy. I don't want nothing to do with the structural. I respect the licensing in the pesticide board, those guys are experts in their field, and I consider myself in my field. So that's that's what I'm going to do. Uh, particle drift. Here we're talking about uh, uh, particle drift. It's small particles of pesticide getting carried away from the application site by the movement of air. And you can see the application coming down here on the turf grass, and the spray droplets are being moved off by the wind. Um, Adjust droplet size and application techniques, and we talked about that just a little bit. You know, your nozzle selection and your pressure will have a lot to do with that. And then I threw this picture in here, guys. Here we have particle drift. It's the movement of the spray droplets produced at the time of application. Vapor drift is the movement of fumes or vapors after a volatile pesticide is applied. So it's turning into a gas and moving off site by the wind. So a good little picture there. Uh, do not spray during temperature inversions. And then cool, this is when cool air is trapped at ground level uh, by warm air so that the air moves horizontally instead of vertically. And we got a good picture here. Uh, there's a good one in your textbook, and this is the one in your textbook. And so normal condition, smoke rises and disperses. Inversion condition, smoke concentrates and it hangs. Well, you don't want to spray during these inversions because if you've got that pesticide drift, that vapor drift hanging out right there, what can it do? It can fall and actually uh, cause uh, damage to neighboring properties. Vapor drift can occur even days after the application. We've got high winds, it's vapor rising into the air, and you know we've sprayed the vegetable here on one side of the road, and then it's affecting our corn on the other side of the road. So guys, it can happen even days later. Water pollution, we have point source pollution, which is a source that is single and identified as a place or event. You know where the contamination took place. Somebody dumps a drum of Roundup near a water drain in the road, curb and gutter. They fell off the truck and it dumped off and broke and it's running down uh, the curb and gutter and going down in, uh, into the gutter. And so we know that that is a single identified spot. Um, it kind of like spills at a mixing site. You know, you got, you bring in your tractor, you bring in your truck sprayer, and you know that you've had a big spill there. That is point source. Uh, spilled wash water at a cleanup. Improper handling of the spills. Improper disposal of containers is one. Back siphoning into well water is a point source solution and then contaminated runoff guys so very dangerous situations when it comes to it just know that that you can identify exactly where it happens non-point source solution is a source of pollution uh, after a broad application where did it happen we can't pinpoint it to a certain area but it can be runoff from a lawn field golf course right away that carries pesticides into the streams rivers ponds and other surface water Runoff is at maximum during and directly after a heavy rain. So again, read the label. It may say try to avoid uh, prior to major thunderstorms coming through. And if you check the weather in the morning and you see that they're calling for major thunderstorms and it dumped two inches on neighboring states the night before, then don't apply it. Don't apply your pesticide that day. Wait another day. Uh, surface water, usually a source of drinking water, so contamination is a health concern. This is where you can get in trouble too, guys. The rate of runoff and erosion depends directly on the slope. How steep is it? Uh, if there is good ground cover or a buffer zone, you want good ground cover. Um, and if you want that buffer zone, you want that area in between your application site and neighboring sites. And sometimes you may have to create that buffer zone by a no spray zone. 
soil characteristics, the particle size and the amount of organic material in the soil, and then the amount and intensity of the rainfall that is soon to happen after. It could all be places of where surface water could get contaminated with our pesticides. Groundwater, underground water in the bedrock, which is a source of wells and spring, 70% of public water supply is groundwater. Guys, don't, don't try to stay away from it. Correcting this groundwater contamination can be almost impossible. Once it's done, it's done. So don't spray near wells. Don't have your, definitely don't have your shop or your pesticide storage with even in a hundred feet or so of, of these wells. Keep, keep it away guys, it's just that important. Um, and here's a good, good diagram from your textbook where we have non-point source solution. You know, we have the, uh, uh, the tractor going through the orchard with the, uh, you know, spraying the trees there. And then we have point source where the five gallon drum dumps off and it goes into, um, um, you know, the well right here where we've got an actual faucet there, guys. Very dangerous situation there. Leaching. Pesticides are more likely to leach into groundwater if it is water soluble. Uh, persistent, slow in breaking down to non-toxic compounds, and non-absorptive. Um, absorptive. So it's going to get into our groundwater if the pesticide has those characteristics. So check it out. Read that label. Maybe there's something else that you can use. Maybe you. Maybe there's a least <sighs> damaging pesticide that's out there. One that's not so persistent. One that's not water soluble one that is faster breaking down, and one that is, that is absorptive. So check it out, guys. Ask, and guys, this, again, comes to where, where it's, it's good to, to know people. And this is almost saying, you know, sometimes it's more about who you know than what you know. And I always say that the smartest person in the room is actually the dumbest person because at least that person has surrounded themselves with smarter people. Now, yes, we all should have the minimum standards to get our pesticide license, but look at the people that we have at our disposal, our pesticide dealers being number one. Talk to them, tell them the situation that you're trying, give them a site evaluation. Hey, this is what I'm doing. This is the treatment that I need. This is the pest I'm trying to control. What do you recommend? They're going to find out for you because they want to sell you something. And then if not, our ag extension agents, gosh, the, uh, just a wealth of knowledge from these people. They're there to help us. You know, people get freaked out. I'm not calling an ag agent office. They'll find I'm doing something wrong. No, if you're talking to them and asking them questions, they're going to respect you and they're going to actually want to help you. That's what they're there for. And guys, anyway, you can, call, you can call your ag extension agent and have them come out and look at your shop and make sure that everything is up to code and they're not going to bust your bubble. They're going to tell you how to correct it and they're going to give you time to correct it and they're going to walk you through the process. They're not going to slap fines on you, but if they do show up and the place is a mess and your pesticides are loose and not locked up and you don't have a good storage area, they could find you. Welcome them to your shop. Get them to come out and look at this stuff. And it definitely when it comes to a pesticide problem like this and you're worried about leaching, you're worried about runoff, whatever, talk to them. They may have a better solution for you. We got a lot of people on our side when it comes to uh, applying these pesticides. You know, the state provides that for us. Um, protecting our water again. Safely apply the pesticide. Only apply when necessary and in adequate amounts. Don't, do, don't apply too much pesticide. Again, that's against the law. Label is the law. You can do spot or ban treatments that will reduce the amount applied. Select the products wisely. Again, that's where your pesticide dealer can come in to, uh, to help you. Calibrate and regularly check your equipment for leaks. Duh, what did we just talk about last but not least in, in unit one? Calibrate every day. Guys, that is the smartest thing you can do and that is the best way to save money and to protect yourself is to calibrate your equipment every single day. Follow label directions and do not exceed the rates. The label is the law. More, 
more is less at this time because it's going to get you in trouble. And then sweep or blow the granules from the surfaces back onto the treated area if it's like a if it's a lawn in a, in a residential neighborhood. And then immediately contain and control the spills. You need to have a, a spill kit on your truck. We'll talk more about that in in, in future lectures. But you've got to have a way to uh, to protect the environment if you do have a pesticide uh, spill. And guys, I'll tell you. I've seen so many times I get behind a pesticide applicator truck and you see drip coming out the back of the truck. And you see this wet line following them. Guys, what if that's pesticide? Hey, sometimes it is, sometimes it ain't. Sometimes it might just be the water leaking from the tank. But what does that say about your company? If you've got your company truck lettered up to the T and then somebody's following you and you're leaving, leaving this wet trail water trail behind you what if it is just water but they see a sprayer in the back of the truck they're automatically going to think you're dumping pesticides out on the road guys stop it do the right thing we even take our backpack sprayers and stick them in a tub in case there's any type of leakage that comes out that the container is going to collect it it's not going to be running out the back of the truck Simple things like that can save you a lifetime of, of payments, guys, when it comes to damaging the environment or worse, damaging somebody and getting them sick and harming, harming people. Identify vulnerable areas. Beware of the streets, the sewers, drains, ditches where runoff may carry the pesticide to our waterways. You need to know your properties inside and out. And you need to know that, hey, there's a drain inlet in the front of this yard that you need to make sure that all the granular application gets blown back into the turf grass. Don't dump or rinse into a storm drain. And I've, I've seen it done. And these, by, these are by non-licensed professionals. Hey, they take a hose out to the street by the, by the uh, curb and gutter, and they're rinsing it out, washing it down into the sewer drain. Unreal, but I've seen it done, guys. Do not mix near or water or wells. Uh, mix pesticides at least 50 feet away from wells. Guys, I'd even take it higher. Uh, 50 feet from the wells, lakes, streams, rivers, and storm drains, I'd at least be 100 feet. Try to always mix and load at the application site. Um, I like mixing in the morning and then taking my stuff out. But yes, there's going to be instances where you run out, so you're going to have to uh, probably mix your, your pesticide application uh, on site. So just, just be careful with that. Make sure it's in a sealed, uh, permanent or portable mixing and loading pads prevent the seepage into the soil. But that's kind of hard to do if you're mixing it at the application site. And guys, what they're really talking about here is large pest, uh, pesticide applications on agricultural sites. You know, it's okay to mix it there at the field. Uh, probably because there's gonna be water available there too. But you know, if you're doing lawn care application, I'd much rather our turf um, specialists drive back to the shop and mix up uh, their pesticide formulations there on site because we can watch it, we can observe it, and we know it's safe. We don't want our guys pulling a garden hose uh, off of somebody's house to fill up their tank. That's just, that's just too big of a risk. Plus, it doesn't look good, and you don't want to take that risk of siphoning it back into um, the city water. And this is exactly what it's talking about. Avoid back siphoning. You can actually suck that pesticide into the uh, the water system uh, by just by just air remember people talking about siphoning gas i mean the same thing can happen with pesticide gas it is a reverse flow of li liquids into a fill hose and prevention means leaving an air gap between the discharge and the end uh and water in the tank so you have to have that air gap right there if you stick that in there it could actually suck it back down into it sensitive areas or where people, plants, animals, and or habitats could be injured by pesticides. Guys, schoolhouse, nursing home. Those are probably two of the worst places uh, to apply a pesticide to. You, you, you don't want to do it. And if you are doing it, you want to do it, you know, on the weekends at the schoolhouse. And then, you know, with the residents in a, in a retirement community, community that's, that's a whole different ballgame because they're there all the time. But this could be... Outdoor sensitive areas will be schools, playgrounds, daycares, nurse home, hospitals, recreational areas, uh, habitats where endangered or threatened species reside, honeybee hives, parks, wildlife refuge, uh, where domestic animals or livestock are kept, uh, food, feed, and nursery crops, or public gardens and playing fields. Guys, anywhere people are going to be. 
anywhere they're going to be. But, you know, we know the older people and the younger people are more susceptible to this damage. Their bodies just don't have the, the good immune systems and they're a little bit weaker in the early stages and definitely in later stages of life. So definitely be extremely careful uh, when doing that. Uh, protect our bees. Read the label. You know, areas with bees, you may have to notify uh, the owners of the beehive. Apply the pesticides in the evening or early morning when the bees are not active. Do not spray when the crops are blooming. And then use spot treatments instead of the broad applications. Uh, endangered and uh, threatened species. Endangered is on the brink of extinction. That means there's just a few of them left. Threatened is likely to become endangered in the new future. So we want to protect both of these species. North Carolina has a program uh, in cooperation with the EPA to protect endangered and threatened species from being harmed by pesticides. Um, view the EPA bulletins to find pesticides use restrictions there at this website address, uh, epa.gov forward slash endangered dash species. And guys, that will conclude chapter six, uh, pesticides in the environment. I will see you in the next lecture. Thanks.